All right, as promised a few weeks ago, I said I was going to do a uh, more spoilery, more in-depth uh, talk about The Force Awakens. Not The Force Awakens, that was the last movie, The Last Jedi. They're all running together, man. More on that in a bit. I was fortunate enough to, my mother wanted to go see it, so I took my mother to see it, so I just saw it again um, yesterday. This is being pre-recorded. Uh, it was interesting to get her perspective on it because she's not a nerd but she loves star wars like part of the reason that um uh, i didn't see star wars as a nerdy thing growing up because my mother is like the polar opposite of a nerd she's always like the life of the party and and you know very many many friends in her circle kind of thing but she likes star wars i was like what is that i didn't realize it's uh master chief's laser rifle rifle but you can't see master chief I forgot what that weapon's called in Halo. Someone will remind me. I'm sure. Um, I prefer the Covenant weapons in Halo. I just kind of proved that. Uh, but um, it was interesting to see her perspective on it because she doesn't get into the minutiae of all of it. She really liked it, even though she could never remember kylo ren's name and eventually i realized it was because they were saying kylo ren and ben solo and she was like ren ben the, the two things were so close to each other that she was like and then ren and ray and and we had the same issue with lord of the rings this is the the naming conventions of science fiction and fantasy always trip my mother up and if it trips my mother up i realize it probably happens to other people as well but that made me realize that a lot of star wars relies on the audience knowing a lot going in <laughs> because of the massive marketing and i think people assumed they knew who kylo ren was because he was the toy from the force awakens right um i in some ways, I actually enjoyed it, in some ways, more um, the second time because I was able to sort of sit back, um, not be constantly warring with my expectations. Um, and I think that whether a person likes The Last Jedi or not um, really depends on your expectations going in. And I think that there were some failures of marketing that Disney committed on this film. I know, heresy to say Disney failed at marketing. I really think that they did. They are, Disney is a company that really believes in tradition. And I respect that intensely with Disney. But they were too wedded to Star Wars marketing traditions, or they made a big mess up, or they were messing with fans. You guys know rule number one with me, never, never, never mislead the fan base. It's why I don't like the way Doctor Who does its thing. It's why I don't like um, Sherlock on the BBC. That creative team, it's the same creative team, deliberately messes with the fan base. I think that's mean. And putting Luke on both the light side and the dark side posters uh, and putting him in the Darth Vader spot in the posters was a mistake. It, it set stupid expectations in the minds of um, the people going into the movie. They thought Luke was going to go dark, there was going to be some big drama, and that wasn't what we got at all. Mark Hamill's performance was brilliant. Um, every scene he's in, I just watched his face. And I think, for me, the moments that make uh, The Last Jedi um, worth having been made were the, the homecoming scenes, if you will, Luke talks to Yoda, Luke talks to R2, Luke talks to Leia. And the way Mark Hamill sold that as coming home, because it very much was for him, he was very much invested in getting the band back together, um, those were the moments for me that 
um, made that film because he's just so underrated as an actor. And if you know Mark Hamill from his voice acting, you know how good he is. I mean, he's the best Joker ever on any screen ever. And people are like, what? They don't know what you're talking about unless they know, you know, Batman the Animated Series and uh, the Arkham games. And the thing about Mark Hamill is he's the anti-George Clooney. George Clooney says he can't save a bad script. Mark Hamill can take dialogue that is garbage and make it work. And it's because he's an actor who struggles with material. He, he is, you know, fundamentally understanding of his character, especially Luke Skywalker. He, in his head, knows who Luke Skywalker is, which is why I, I totally give him credit and I totally give Disney credit for letting him say he fundamentally disagreed with the direction. But because of that, he took a twist on Luke Skywalker because he knows Luke Skywalker, you know, more than some whippersnapper who just, you know, steps in because he made some other movies that people like watching. Because he knew that, because he knows that character so well, and he is such a talented actor, he manages to make incredible something that could be a hot mess. And to me, the cool thing is that, and, and this is when I start, um, you know, taunting the ire of the Ray haters out there. Um, I already did enough of that on Twitter, more on that in a bit. Um, but the primary assertion of the Ray haters is that Rey is too perfect, she never fails, she has no uh, flaws. And I fundamentally disagree with that because it is something of an arrogance of youth that she just sort of thought she could show up and kind of use the force to make Luke Skywalker come back and join the fight. And it wasn't her that ended up convincing him. She failed. She failed hard. It was Yoda and R2-D2. And, and Leia, in her own way, um that convinced him to come back. And I think that by challenging Mark Hamill to put this character in this place, we actually got a, a, a really great Luke Skywalker movie. And I think fans probably would have been a little bit happier if everything else was cut down and we just got a Luke Skywalker character piece. Now, you can't do that. I know that. Um, because you have to sell toys and you have to sell play sets and you need to start with the crawl and, and pan down and, and you know, you have to have a cantina scene and you have to do this and you have to do that. There are just, and this is what I mean that Disney's a little too close to tradition. Um, I thought, I liked everything but the last 10 minutes of Rogue One. Um, I uh, thought that the last 10 minutes of Rogue One were so unnecessarily nihilistic that I didn't buy it. And I know some people have some feelings with um, these, with The Force Awakens and with The Last Jedi that they just can't buy in. And I think that's one of those things that it's a personal thing. And if you can't do it, you just can't do it. And no amount of explaining in the world will make you want to do it. Um, my, my husband and I are divided on the Canto Blight stuff. He thought it was, was too long and, and boring and, and pointless. And I disagree. I thought there was a pretty critical thing, well, two critical things about the Canto Bite stuff. And for people who don't memorize the names of all things Star Wars, let me tilt the camera down a little bit. Canto Bite is the casino world where the horse bunny mountain goat thingies are on the track. Yeah, and the guy puts coins in BB-8. That's how most people who are not nerds talk about Star Wars. The thing that did the thing that was the thing, as opposed to Canto, or Canto Bite or Moss Eisley or uh, Cloud City, you know, Vespin. Um, so, in the place of the horses in the casino, we learn two things about the modern Star Wars world as controlled by the, f the First Order. The First Order is being propped up by an arms trade meaning that a lot of their incompetence can be explained with the fact that not only is there, you know, the balance of the light and dark, and no matter which side tries to go, the Force will always uh, attempt to achieve balance. 
So for every big bad that gets spit out or gets created, that it will spit out a good guy to balance out the bad guy. Um, I have some theories on that, but I'll save my theories to the end. Um, similarly, these arms traders who are selling to both sides and making a lot of money off of it have a vested interest in this war continuing. If the First Order wins completely, then they don't make as much money because they don't need to buy as many arms. If the rebels win completely, same thing. These very rich Canto biters only maximize the profits if the fight continues. And so it kind of makes sense that they'd staff um, the, the, superior, the, the superior arsenal with incompetence that keep the war going. Hence the obvious blinders on Snoke and General Hux. Um, I had a discussion on Twitter with people, one of the fun Star Wars discussions on Twitter instead of just the very, very angry, insulting ones. But, um, you know, we talked about the fact that there would have been a lot of retirements and a lot of deaths and things like that under the Empire. And so historically, you do sort of see very young militaries when you have a, a refresh like that. So the fact that Hux is younger, um, it's, uh, it kind of... It kind of makes sense. Um, and this is where I remember I said you just bounce off something and you can't really help it. It's a really personal thing. Um, I am repelled by Kylo Ren and I continue to be repelled by Kylo Ren. Um, and, and hear me out. People are like, but, 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 guys, this is a totally personal thing. Don't try to defend him. It just makes it worse. Okay. Because this is a personal thing. Um, Kylo Ren is exactly what I thought he was in the first. He's a petulant child and something of a loser who is really only where he is because of who his parents, uncle, and grandfather were. And they've pretty much established that. Now, to me, having come from nothing... Uh, that was pretty poignant to me in Star Wars for reasons that all these but, 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 but types don't quite get. Um, Kylo Ren is where he is because of nepotism and because everybody sees him for more than he is because of his lineage. And that makes him to me an inherently disgusting character. And the fact that he's constantly smashing things and he has anger management problems... Darth Vader had a nobility to him. He had a competence to him that when Luke was going, I think there's still good in you. I could buy that. I don't know how a spoiled brat is redeemable. And that's just my bias against rich brats. It's not logical. I know, like, if I actually think about it, it's like, okay, yeah, technically our, the Prime Minister of Canada is a rich brat who lived in, in something of rarefied air and, and they have something to offer the world too. But I just don't like him. It's just like, here's a guy who has every opportunity to him. He, he has options. And he picks the shittiest ones over and over and over again because of the, oh, poor little rich boy thing of, I have to live up to my family legacy. It's like, you know, which one? The, the, the smuggler? Your dad? You know, the military general mom? The, the, the Jedi master uncle? Oh no, you pick your dark side granddaddy who you never actually knew which a lot of people do. A lot of people kind of glomp on to the family member who wasn't alive their entire life because they can never reject them. And I do get the sense that, and I wish they'd do more of this. I think Kylo Ren is who he is because of who his father was. You know that line, um, Han was Han about it, that Luke says to Rey talking about training Ben Solo? I think that that rejection of the father is something that they kind of have to delve into for Kylo Ren to be at all sympathetic to me because I don't know why everyone is killing themselves to save someone who seems essentially a lost cause. Um, there are not supposed to be lost causes 
in Star Wars. I know, certainly not Skywalkers. But I do not see anything saving Kylo Ren other than he thinks Rey is pretty. And that makes my perception of it, and it's all about perception, right? Like, I'm supposed to identify with Rey. I really don't. Um, she's supposed to be this scrappy upstart that comes from junk, junk dealers. Like, yeah, 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 that checks every box with me. But, I, you know, it, it's, it's the visual. They just made her Star Wars girl visually, and she is so similar to Hermione in Harry Potter as well. There's not enough distinct about her to really make me like her. Now, I think Daisy Ridley gives quite a spunky performance. She is too young to get the nuance of a Mark Hamill or a Carrie Fisher or a Laura Dern. Not her fault. She's doing the best she can at this point in her career. But this is where I think Disney is making a mistake with how they introduce these new characters. It happened with the Dallas reboot as well, but not very many people saw it. So, or the the, re the continuing story of Dallas. Um, people who watch the original Dallas, people who watch the original Star Wars, tune in to see their old favorites, and they'll pick up new favorites along the way. I think that if you just tell a story and allow um, the new characters to earn their place, then people are going to like them. The mistake they've made um, is deliberately, and I'm, I'm not guessing on this, both J.J. Abrams and, and Ryan Johnson have said they, you know, this is about the new characters, we can't overuse the old characters. I don't think you can overuse the old characters. Um, the more you can get them on screen, the better. Now, Already huge missed opportunity with Carrie Fisher. Um, she's gone. They can't do anything about that. But every moment she was there, even when she was in a coma, she was freaking awesome. Um, but they would really make a mistake. And, and, and there's an obvious way to put, you know, Mark Hamill in in the the third movie you know ryan johnson talks like oh luke skywalker's dead whatever you don't get to say that anymore ryan johnson you have handed it back to jj abrams um who i'm pretty sure is kylo ren in his heart doubling back to that you know i i put up this tweet this is when we talk about twitter but why is ray widely seen as a mary sue but kylo ren's not even though you know he's the one that Everybody inexplicably thinks is great, even though there's not much to him. And eh, oh my goodness, the anger! You'd you'd swear you'd swear I insulted people's mothers. Um, the whole idea of a Mary Sue I find very silly, because the Mary Sue is up there for me with the, the Bechdel test. It's a colloquialism that somebody thought was cute and has taken on way too much power. There is no set accepted test for a Mary Sue. It's a very subjective thing. There are two somewhat competing definitions for Mary Sue. One is a poorly written self-insert character, which is what I understood it to be. The other is that it's this impossibly perfect character with no flaws. That's a tricky one. That is a tricky one. First of all, because it's a term that applies to fan fiction, and we can argue about whether, you know, a licensed sequel is in fact fan fiction. I I can see the argument for no, this is this is um very entitled nerd boys playing in the Star Wars sandbox. But I can also see Disney owns a property, it's a LucasArts film. This isn't fan fiction, this is canon. So the whole Mary Sue term really doesn't apply. It's a fan fiction term. But there are, there was something created a while back called the Mary Sue litmus test that due to political correctness fell out of favor because they thought it was uh, judgy and, and uh, discouraged young women from writing stories in other people's universes. Um, keep in mind, the only reason that Star Wars exists is that George Lucas couldn't get the right to Flash Gordon, so he made his own movie. Um, but 
some of the markers of Mary Sudom are that it's a relative of existing main characters and that they are oddly beloved. Now, my interpretation of Rey is she tends to show up people and everybody's like, get out of here, kid. And then she sort of shows them that she has merit. And so they sort of begrudgingly go, okay, you can stay. Whereas Kylo Ren um, seems to be terrible at any at everything, and yet he is literally the supreme leader, which is a lot more like what happens in Twilight to Bella Swan, who is a, a known Mary Sue. Everybody knows that um, uh, Twilight started off... Um, no, sorry, Fifty Shades of Grey started off as Twilight fanfiction, didn't it? Bella is very much a Mary Sue, if it was fan fiction. It is the audience proxy that oddly is pulled into this magical, amazing story and this, this magical boyfriend happens to fall in love with her. But the thing about Twilight, if you actually read Twilight, is Bella is constantly going on about how terrible she is and nobody likes her and like that, that is serious Mary Sudom. I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. And and everybody else is like, no, 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 you really, we believe in you. Come play with us. You can be our friend. We love you. There are, there is way more of that. And I'm not saying this to just piss anybody off. That came later. When I realized how invested people were in stuff that just didn't matter, then I started to have some fun with it. But um, there are there is a serious argument to be made for Kylo Ren being the self-insert character of J.J. Abrams in that he's a guy with horrendous imposter syndrome that just gets where he is because he has the right friends and that's his superpower. Now... This flies in the face of this idea that a Mary Sue is impossibly perfect. I disagree with the fact that all Mary Sues are just imper are, are perfect characters. Because Bella in Twilight isn't. And if we take Bella as the archetype, because, I mean, Hermione is the Mary Sue in Harry Potter. She is very clearly J.K. Rowling, you know, the girl with all the answers. Um, but we don't criticize that the same way. And if you think about it, Hermione's pretty exceptional, but she doesn't get all the things, so it's okay. She sort of knows her place. It's these characters that are elevated above their status that people tend to have a problem with. Now, I think, and, and this is where I'm going to just sort of defend the whole idea of a Mary Sue overall, um, there is a distinct literary tradition, sorry, roll in your eyes, tradition, history, facts, what? Ugh. Stop watching now if you just want to stop watching. But there is a distinct literary tradition of heroes that are better than the rest of us. They're called paragons, the original heroes before sort of this Judeo-Christian moralizing were... You know, these guys who could, you know, pull a, a thorn out of a lion's paw. And like all the Greek myth and Kratos, right? Kratos is a traditional Greek hero turned on his ear. So instead of it being this guy who does all these great feats and we sing songs and tell stories about him, we understand his inner turmoil. But the idea of a hero traditionally has been that, has been somebody who's our better who's better than us. Um, by today's standards, it would be considered a poorly written character because they don't have enough internal conflict, which is why Hollywood can't write a damn good Superman movie. They overthink it. But in lit literary tradition, that is a hero. Somebody who is morally pure, and skilled and is is looking out for the rest of us they have this exceptional strength that they are using for good so the rest of us can sleep well at night the idea of the anti-hero came about because of you know a, a huge leap forward in um 
anti-hero fiction was Lord Byron. And the reason it's called a Byronic hero is all of his Byronic heroes were Lord Byron writing himself into everything he did. This is not my opinion. This is accepted. He was just writing stories about, about himself because Byron, if he was anything, he was a narcissist. So we have male Mary Sue's, and I just say Mary Sue for everything. I don't buy this Gary Stu shit. Like, no. Um, we have accepted Mary Sue's all throughout fiction. It's lauded as great works. We have to study this shit in college. This is where I came from. I had to study this crap, and I'd be like, well, this is just a Mary Sue. No, it's Byron. It's this great literature. You have to, how dare you? you know, no, it's Mary Sue. Hemingway drives me crazy in that way because Hemingway to me is just trying to create the ideal man and the ideal man happens to be the characteristics that he holds himself. And you're not supposed to say that because that's a humanities approach. In English literature, we don't take biography of the author, blah, blah, blah. Can, can you guys tell where my... um? where my disdain for postmodernism came from. Like, what do you mean I'm supposed to throw out information regarding the interpretation of a text? Like, I can't use that Mervyn Peake was probably schizophrenic? Fuck off, it informs the work, you know? Lewis Carroll being a mathematician in his day job informs the work, these things matter. The fact that, Tol that Tolkien, <laughs> Tolkien was both a, uh, a Catholic and a pothead matters, <laughs> but, in English literature, you're not allowed to use biography of the author because they look down on humanities because humanities is a fun course. Welcome to my misspent youth in university. But uh, the funny thing was I got these lectures uh, mostly from a guy who was teaching an English course, but he was actually a comparative lit professor. So he knew more about Greek and Roman stuff than he did about actual books written in the English language. It's... This is a thing for another time. But the so-called Mary Sue is an accepted part of literary canon. Um, you know, you can accuse Jane Austen of doing some of it. You can accuse the Bronte sisters of doing some of it. Um, there were certain elements in Shakespeare's work where the commoner is always sort of this likable comic relief who goes <laughs> on all of you because Shakespeare came from common stock. Um, most writers put themselves in their work somewhere. And it is actually a bit of a critic's position instead of a creator's position to demonize that. And that's why I don't like the um, the whole raise a Mary Sue thing because it neglects history. If she is, so what? First of all, it doesn't make any sense that she's actually a Mary Sue. She's probably more like every other character in um, the uh, in the new Star Wars franchise, a character laser targeted to sell toys to a certain demographic. Um, Poe Dameron is a perfect, rebellious Han Solo with a heart of gold, you know? He's designed to fill that void with Han Solo people, because they like the rebel, they like the guy who makes that kind of mistakes. He is perfected for his archetype. Finn is stand there and be black, essentially. We don't know very much about what Finn feels about anything other than that he hates Captain Phasma. Because if Finn has any op opinions about anything, then he may alienate part of the African-American consumer base that he's designed to sell toys to, as well as the politically correct white allies that feel like they're good parents because their children have black action figures. I know I'm being cynical, guys, but this is the calculus. Ray is no better or no worse in that calculus. She is basically Kim Possible in Star Wars. She is the same female heroine that Disney pumps out over and over and over and over again. We just notice because she looks too much like Princess Leia. They did not define her, but if you actually look at the other two, you know, newbie trio, 
Uh, it's just that Oscar Isaacs had a lot more acting experience and he knew how to put more of himself into that character. Poe Dameron on his face isn't the greatest character. He was supposed to die in The Force Awakens anyway. They expanded the character, right? Now, he may get a bit of a pass because of that, that he wasn't part of the initial marketing calculus. But you cannot approach a Disney film without understanding that these are the levers that make the film work. And, and yes, Kylo Ren is very much an angry nerd that is going to provide a certain amount of validation to the angry nerd contingent that goes to Star Wars. All these fanboys who are out there defending Kylo Ren as the most realistic character, that's exactly what Disney wants you to think. You are the demographic for the character, and that's how it all works. It's U-shaped box marketing. It's the same reason everybody thought they loved Buffy, even though that series was half shit at best. There was one character in that show that really validated you in some way. And because you liked that so much, you kept giving them your money because you bought the comics and you bought the merchandise and you bought those cheesy Buffy the Vampire branded steaks, right? Like wooden steaks, not meat steaks. Um, but it was all very calculated. And Disney is even more calculated. So you like the character you like because you're supposed to. And I think that's why I glance off Ray, even though I know on paper I'm really supposed to like her. There has not been a Star Wars character that I have connected with like, and I'll say Princess Leia because it was back then, um, since. Because so much of Princess Leia was Carrie Fisher just shining through essentially a stock character. You know, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope, is pretty much the rallying cry of the damsel in distress, except Carrie Fisher is so freaking tough and interesting and conflicted as a person that she rose above that. And the fact that, you know, she is constantly insulting people and is rough around the edges and isn't afraid to bust someone down and all that stuff. I don't think that was originally there. I think that was what she brought to it and why the character sort of, it didn't make sense for her to be a princess forever. She's very much a general. But that is who they cast. And they say that, you know, George Lucas casted people who were shorthands for the people they were supposed to play. So they didn't need a lot of dialogue. You understood who they were um, just based on the the overwhelming personality of the, the person playing them. And I think that when you get an ingenue, crazy trained, you know, practically bred in a vat um, ingenue actress like Daisy Ridley, that formula fails. Who is she? What are we supposed to believe? Okay, she's Space Hermione. But that's it. She's Space Hermione. She's pretty, but not offensively pretty. You know, um, beautiful, but in, in, a, in a kind of boyish way. There's no, there's no dangerous curves that, that oh, goodness, we, we can't possibly have breasts or hips. No, 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 no. Parents don't like that. We can't sell toys with boobies. Um, and she's good at everything, the same way Hermione Granger was. Now, J.K. Rowling was smart and recognized that people would absolutely love a female character who is good at everything in service of the male protagonist, but Disney tried to push it one step further. And they didn't realize that formulas don't work in your main character. Everybody else can be formulaic, but that main character, that has to be somebody that people can kind of grasp onto and beloved and feel like you know them. They have to be the audience's best friend. And when George Lucas wrote the story of a kid who grew up on a backwater planet with dreams and skills, you know, and went on to save the galaxy with feelings, I think he was basically putting a part of himself into that film. And that's why deriding the Mary, Mary Sue is so bad, because J.J. Abrams definitely put a part of himself in The Force Awakens. And it seems like there's sort of a part of Ryan Johnson in uh, The Last Jedi. 
but it's not going into Rey. Rey is not the self-insert character. Kylo Ren is the self-insert character. We know what Kylo Ren is afraid of. We know what he's insecure about. And so we can judge failure because we know what he wants. We really don't know that much about Rey because Rey is being written as, oh, she's the girl that's good at stuff. Because the people writing Rey don't understand Rey. Rey isn't a Mary Sue. She is a shameless attempt at bringing in a new demographic of consumers to Star Wars. If you want to complain about that, go for it. And if you disagree with me, that's fine. There is no need to get angry, okay? This is what I found so interesting, and I'm going long on this video just because people got really, really mad at me over this for having a go, having a laugh, trolling a little bit, if you will. But I don't, I don't like that term because, like, trolling used to be, yeah, you poked at something that really didn't matter and giggled when people got mad at shit that really didn't matter. Now it's this evil, nefarious, out to hurt someone thing. And you've got to be careful with colloquial definitions. I mean, Mary Sue Troll, it means different things to different people. So, you know, if it's poking at people to see if they're really getting worked over, up over something that doesn't matter. Yeah, okay, if you believe that, then I was trolling. But if you actually believe that trolling has some nefarious intent to hurt someone and ruin lives, no. No, no, no. And that's what trolling has become to mean. And I, I guess it's the scientist in me that I, when something seems weird to me, I don't shy away from it. I poke it to try to understand it. And that's what sort of happened when I put up that original thing. It's like, oh, people are going to get mad at this, but hey, playing devil's advocate here. You guys know I love to play devil's advocate, literally the devil. But um, I put up a thing. This is it's going to be pretty funny to see how enraged people get. And people got enraged anyway. And this only happens when people feel like their identity is under attack. Not, you know, me pointing out that, hey, if we're going to play the Mary Sue game... There's more culprits than just Ray, and if you include the self-insert element of Mary, so it was an intellectual curiosity for me. I think you're probably seeing that. But people got it was like I was attacking their family name, and that was really interesting to me. That actually fed into my theory that the real kind of fan insert, the fan fiction mistake of creating a character who just is there to soothe a, a particular type of person is much more alive and well in Kylo Ren. Now, do I think this is a bad thing? No. And this is where I think a lot of the communication breaks down. To go out and scream, Mary Sue, Mary Sue, Mary Sue, so what? Even if a character is a Mary Sue, so what? You know, the, in the implication is, well, that's bad. That's junk writing. One person even said, and you call yourself a writer. And this was somebody who'd actually been blocked by me in the early days when I used to block people. And I unblocked him to give another chance. And it was sort of like, oh yeah, this is the kind of reason you got blocked. You go way too personal with this stuff. And I... I cannot be everyone's mom, you know? Everybody's aunt, maybe, but everybody's mom, no, that's an unfair expectation. You don't go at someone and say, you call yourself a writer over a fight over Star Wars. That's just off the hook, guys. But people do this. And I realize that's Kylo Ren taking that mask and going, bah, 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 bah. you know, he just punches things five more times than he really has to punch them because Snoke made him feel temporarily bad at it. So you, you smashed your cosplay, dude. Good job. You're just going to probably have to remake the cosplay because everybody with a Kylo Ren license goes, well, shit. Now the mask isn't relevant anymore. Um, licensors hate that, by the way. But, um... I realize that, yeah, it's too close. It's too close to the bone. But I think it's interesting that the empathy for that state, um, where 
that may be a stereotype. The whole angry fanboy as portrayed by Kylo Ren may be a stereotype, but it's a stereotype that resonates with a lot of people. What people are not seeing is the flip side of it, which is that Rey is a stereotype that resonates with a different kind of person. And Poe is a stereotype that, rec that uh, resonates with a different type of person still. And there are different levels of acceptability regarding which stereotype you identify with. And if there's any stereotype in all of Star Wars that I kind of resonate in the new characters, it's probably Rose. But Rose lost me at the end because I thought she, uh, she was she was kind of cute. She's like, if you're watching Runaway, she's like the Gert of the, the of Star Wars. She kind of sees stuff. Um, but then, oh, she's suddenly in love with a boy. And I'm like, check out! Character lost me right there. That is one of the two or three, like, just flat out, I believe, mistakes in the film. One was that completely tone deaf in terms of the audience who uh, who is going to like Rose. Um, Ray, you can kind of accept, you know, might want a boyfriend at some point. But Rose, no, 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 no. We don't want her to be a boy chaser. We don't want to be the girl who's mooning after a guy who's interested in the pretty girl. No, 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 no. That's high school all over again. Get that the fuck away from me, right? Um... I lost my train of thought there about stereotype. Okay, mistake. Second one was the Chewie and the Porg scene where Chewie was eating the Porgs. That put a lot of kids off. I have a friend, he said the two daughters are the big into Star Wars. They hate Chewbacca now because of that. Just a mistake. Forgot who, who that sector of the audience was. There were ways of making that joke because like the punchline was all, you know, the Porg going and Chewie going and and then becoming friends but how do you become friends with a guy who just ate like uncle bill and cousin steve you know okay the porgs are puffins but still people hated that scene hated it and if you're trying to sell toys to kids you don't do that okay and then there was one other thing that i'm blanking on right now um that was was just a mistake it's not obviously it's not as big but um i didn't think that leia in space was a mistake because as cheesy as i realized it was that was a moment where like six-year-old me has wanted to see for decades so if you guys are allowed to have your cheesy kylo ren ray fight i'm allowed to have princess leia finally uses the freaking force because all this time because when it turned out that she was luke's sister Everybody went, well, why can't she use the Force? And the extended canon was that she did it. She just did it by being a great general, like being a leader, instead of being able to do all the Jedi tricks. Force sensitives and Jedis are not the same thing. One's a subgroup of the other. But we never actually got to see her use the Force. And so while people think it, it was cheesy, I, I couldn't help but go, that was really cool. You know, it also sets up an easy way to write her out of the third movie even though that wasn't in the plan but i didn't really think that was a mistake i didn't think there were terrible terribly many outright mistakes i just think that people have built up star wars in their minds um in in the rearview mirror i'm trying to think of what that third mistake was it'll come to me just to finish but it's already gotten too long so most of you probably aren't watching anymore um I think that so many people have built up Star Wars in their own memories of the event into more than it actually was. And if you go back, you know, from the beginning, they are heavily flawed films. But they're good films. And perfect cannot be the enemy of the good. And... To me, I thought that was one of the big messages that The Last Jedi brought to the table. That failure is an excellent teacher. And when you pass on your knowledge to anybody, you know, Star Wars handing off, Lucas handing off the franchise to Disney. He said he did that 
so it could sort of survive. And I think there's something of a metaphor there in ending the sort of death grip that the Jedi had on the light side of the Force, the same way the, the Sith... I mean, Snoke is not a Sith. Kylo Ren is not a Sith. They're Knights of Ren. They're basically Sith fanboys that are kind of not Sith. They, they need to tighten up the edges of that a little bit more in, in, in stuff. But, um, you know, there, there were some discombobulations and some faults in logic and some real undue restrictions in the whole Jedi Order as conceived in Star Wars. And I think they recognize that in order to open this up to everyone, um, they need to loosen the reins. And I think that's what they're doing here. I think that's the right call. Um, I am okay with, you know, as a huge fan of the original trilogy, this new trilogy not being for me, um, because everybody has their trilogy and the trilogy that is for you is the one that was made when you were 10 years old. So, or six years old or, you know, whatever. I was younger than 10 when... <laughs> Star Wars movies came out, but you can't help that. You can't change that because those movies are made for 10 year olds. And unless you go in there with the idea of I'm going to watch this movie the way a 10 year old would or a six year old would or an eight year old would, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to come out not liking it because that's not the mindset, you know, some people will never forgive the Academy for giving Chariots of Fire the best picture Oscar instead of Star Wars because... The Academy doesn't reward movies made for, for 10-year-olds. They make movies for people with the emotional capacity of 14-year-olds. It's different. That was a joke. Um, but yeah, please don't come to blows about Star Wars, guys. Like, really, please don't. Um, you can learn a lot about someone from what they liked and didn't like about the movie if you're not so tied up in defense of your own identity through the U-shaped box that, that you identify with, th that you shut out dialogue. And the very strong reactions that I encountered, I, I have this self-defense mechanism where I laugh at stuff when otherwise I would be really freaked out and, and scared by, by what I encountered. And, and that was sort of my reaction to this, this anger over Star Wars. Every time I encounter it, it's like, you're getting angry over a, um, a franchise that, that, you know, preaches fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to the dark side there's a fundamental cognitive dissonance and it's almost like certain people, the Kylo Ren's of the world have been, I have low self-esteem, so I don't think I'm actually capable of being a light side practitioner. I see a place for myself in the dark side of the force. The fact that that exists at all and is given any sort of value is something I connect to. So I'm going to go there because the light side is just too hard. And I'm not criticizing that. I've just seen this over and over and over again. That the whole teaching of Star Wars um, is that, you know, sort of the strongest guy doesn't necessarily win. The person with, with perseverance and altruism and, and who is willing to have faith in their friends, um, they're the one that ends up being the big hero. I know that's not the message a lot of people take from Star Wars, but that is kind of the message of the, the original trilogy. I'm not sure this trilogy has a message. Individual films do. I don't know overarching. We're going to have to see how J.J. Abrams brings it home. I think he's the right guy to do it because he did the first one. So he kind of knows what he had in mind with that first one. He can round it out in a way that at least is going to seem 
like it has an intellectual coherence, but he's got to stop copying and start telling a story. If he phones in another Kylo Ren copycat of Return of the Jedi, then people are going to be disappointed. He needs to become, you know, if he if he thinks he's dark side, he has to become a Sith Lord and just freaking tell it, go it, swing for the fences. Because I think the problem, I think the thing that a lot of people are reacting to is not that they didn't like the story they were given. There is some of that in The Last Jedi, but they seem to be responding for the fact that there's not enough character development for their liking. And that tells me that's somebody who may be a complete malcontent, but they still at their core really, really love the franchise. And they deserve to be heard, but that doesn't mean you're changing the story. That just means you pay more attention to how the characters react to what's happening to them than to put in those stock. We must have a, we must have a, uh, uh, you know, a desert farm planet. We must have a, a cantina. We must have this. We must have that. We must have the Ewok song at the end. Directors of Star Wars films going forward have to pay less attention to the physical beats in the plot structure and pay more attention to that amazing character development that the original um, trilogy and even the prequels in their own way it was all a big character study about Anakin Skywalker but you know that was their strength and that's what they haven't hit yet and that's why they need Mark Hamill in the third movie because oh my god he was just the reason to see Star Wars and like I said that was what I watched for. That's what I was hoping for. I'm just really happy Mark Hamill got to show what he's capable of in, you know, the Alec Guinness role. In, you know, he's the elder statements going in, showing the kids how he's how it's all done. Like, let me let me teach you how to do this. Let me teach you my craft, kitties. It was so great that he got that. And so I'm ending where I begin. And so that's why everybody can dump on The Last Jedi all they want. My opinion of the movie is not going to change because we got that. And we got to see Mark Hamill put a great performance on the big screen with his own face. <laughs> that's respect. That's the guy who was mocked and, and considered the failure of Star Wars and all that stuff for decades. And there he is just and it's God, home run, like that. Anybody who's a creator, anybody who's a craftsman, anyone who puts himself out in the media can't help but get hope from that because he was derided for so many years. And to me, that's the thing that I've seen no op-eds on. They've praised his performance, but not recognized that you, you film critic, you were the one crapping on him for 40 years. So took me an hour to get that out but there's a lot of star wars to star wars so if you didn't watch i don't really care if you didn't watch the end because i did this as a promise and talking about star wars is fun and porks i love porks i really really like porks porks are cute why did chewie eat the porks i didn't like that at all